Hello. Hopefully everyone can see me. Um, welcome everyone to the virtual book launch of Natalie Warren's Hudson Bay Bound, Two Women, One Dog, 2,000 Miles to the Arctic. I am so excited to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Lee Wu. I am the board secretary for Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Um, and they are one of the co-hosts for today. Friends of the Boundary Waters um, Wilderness is dedicated to protecting the Boundary Waters and the surrounding Quetical Superior Wilderness. I also want to recognize the other amazing organizations co-hosting this event with us. The University of Minnesota Press, Friends of the Mississippi River, Voyagers Con Conservancy, and St. Croix River Association. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of this because I have known Natalie Warren and Ann Rejo in the book um, since we were teenagers at Camp Minogen. Um, since their Hudson Bay trip years ago, um, this book has been years in the making. I cannot express how long. Um, and through the years, I've been privy to seeing snippets of it. So the fact that it is now here and tangible is really exciting for me and that they get to share their journey with you. Um, they are the first two women to canoe the 2000 mile route from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay. So I consider them one of my dearest and most badass friends that I know. Um, you can purchase a copy of the book at Majors and Quinn and there are signed books available there. So just to kind of set the pace for today's evening, there will be polls that pop up um, throughout the evening and feel free to participate and if you have any questions, um, use the Q&A function at the bottom toolbar and you can enter that into the function. And if there are questions that you like or is very similar to the one that you wanna ask, you can always upvote. So you just press the uh, thumbs up button and that question then gets moved up. So the more votes, then the higher it gets. So to get started on this delightful evening, um, I wanna introduce uh, Christian Tweeden, who was the editor for Natalie's book from the University of Minnesota Press. Hi everyone, um, welcome to this great night in celebration of Natalie Warren's new book, Hudson Bay Bound. Um, I was fortunate to work with Natalie on this project for the University of Minnesota Press. Um, and I just wanted to say a quick word about this extraordinary book. If you have already read it, then you know uh, that Natalie's skill in a canoe is just about as sharp as her skill as a storyteller. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, then you're in for a real treat. Um, as an editor, one of the privileges of the job is um, to be able to work with really talented and driven individuals like Natalie who uh, conceive of a story that's just too good not to share. And this particular story begins with a copy of Eric Severed's Canoeing with the Cree and it lands in Natalie's lap. And what follows is a three month odyssey as she and Anne Rejo become the first two women to recreate um, that historic route. Natalie comes to her role as an author with a considerable amount of environmental uh, knowledge about the issues facing Northern rivers and the communities um, through which they flow. And Hudson Bay Bound opens our eyes to that reality with a lot of wit, um, a lot of candor, and a lot of curiosity. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking about this tonight. I doubt that Severide and Port, Walter Port, would have, uh, I doubt they could have imagined what would become of the rivers that, that they made history on 90 years ago. They likely um, would never have celebrated spring break at Hell's Gate like Natalie did. Um, I doubt they would have listened to Crunk Hits Volume 4 on their trip, um, but I do, I would like to think that they would love Hudson Bay Bound. Um, just like Canoeing with the Cree, this is a book that is inspired by that same thirst for adventure, um, and that's the making of a good story. So let's face it, a lot of us are not going to canoe from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay. I, for one, would never make it. Um, out of Minneapolis probably. So the next best thing is to paddle alongside somebody who has done it, uh, even if it's through the pages of the book. So um, the Minneap uh, University of Minnesota Press were really, really honored to be Natalie's publisher. Um, and it's my pleasure to now introduce someone who has been a wonderful champion of this book, uh, Anne Bancroft. Thanks, Kristen. Um, thank you so much. It's uh, a tremendous honor um, 
for me to be here tonight, certainly, um, but also to uh, um, have been asked to, to write the intro um, for Hudson Bay Bound. Um, I fell in love with Canoeing with the Cree um, and its story by Eric Severide um, when I was in high school, my father, um, I think as a freshman, uh, put the book in front of me and um, it, it just is a, a marvelous adventure. And, and then um, so many years ago, I was able to meet Anne and Natalie on the shores of the Mississippi um, as they were getting ready to embark on their grand adventure. And it was this moment of, uh, you know, there were so many people around. That they didn't know a lot of the people that had come to wish them well. And um, we were thrown together as sort of like these women who, um, uh, they were about to embark on a history making adventure and I had been on a couple. And so um, some people threw us together and I knew at that instant when I met them and the sparkle in their eye that I would meet them again as you know, well after they had paddled off um, and done this adventure. And certainly that has, that has happened. And um, what, what a joy for me. Um, the trip you know, really resonated as I was reading the transcript for Natalie's book um, there were several things that really resonated with me. Um, and I started to hark back um, really in, when I was embarking on my first big public expedition in 1986. And that trip, much like Natalie's and Anne, Anne's trip was just pure desire. It was just the joy of planning and executing a grand adventure. And the second thing that sort of evolved out of their story that resonated was that something in our journeys captivated the imagination of so many people beyond our sphere, beyond our family and friends. It's not why we went, we went out of this sense of just our heart beating faster at the, at the mere thought of, of wanting to do it. And, um, but something about our, perhaps our pluck, our gumption to wanting to uh, extend ourselves in that way captured something. It was probably the human spirit. And, um, and you know, you don't go on these trips sometimes to create something. Um, and I think that was true for Natalie and Anne but it certainly did in so many ways. Um, in 1930, Eric Severide and Walter Port um, did their trip. And they too, I think when you read those two, those two books, you see that they too had um, many parallels um, to each other. Uh, Walter and Eric were young, Natalie and Anne were young and they were just heading out on a grand adventure and they were best friends. And I think the other thing that I thought was so remarkable in its similarity was that um, Walter and Anne were really the catalyst to push the two authors um, uh, to really make this trip come into its light. And, um, and so, you know, there's nothing like a best friend, right? That is gonna push you, help push you um, and move, move it from idea to actuality. And I just, I, I love that those two things um, sort of rode, um, what, how many years, um, uh, 80 some years apart from each other. Um, so there, there's, I just, I just love both books so much. Um, they, uh, they help us, you know, imagine something beyond ourselves. As, as Kristen said, you know, I could never get out of Minneapolis. Um, it, they're remarkable in what they took on. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a grand journey in so many, so many ways. And, um, 
it's uh, it it really demonstrates um, the tenacity that these two women had um, as you read their book, uh, the struggles that they have, the the going upstream, the winds, uh, just the the elbow to elbow with each other. Um, and, and the strain that that can have on a friendship and then getting through that, um, it's, it's, a remarkable, it's a remarkable story. Um, I would say that both books are wonderful companions to each other. So if you haven't picked up Canoeing with the Cree, um, please do and for sure pick up Hudson Bay Bound. Um, they stand alone with each other um, and separately and they're, they, I think what's wonderful is that they um, offer uh, important and unique perspectives to how much has changed in those years that, that span from one trip to another. Um, and uh, you, you see, you, you get to travel through time in a way on these lakes and on these rivers. And, and in some ways, maybe more importantly, through these communities. Um, and you see how much has changed in 81 years, and you also see how, how little has changed in 81 years. Um, and it's, it's fascinating. And I think what you come away with is the sense that um, uh, there, is a, there is a human, there, well, there's just such a, a great spirit in the North that invites you in um, as strangers, um, that uh, you find uh, folks that care so much about the environment that they're living in. Um, you see the challenges of, in, of living and existing in these environments. Um, and Natalie brings this wonderful, as Kristen said, this wonderful perspective as a naturalist uh, and really knowledgeable about the natural world and she can bring that into, into the narrative. So it's, it's Hudson Bay Bound is just a great read on so many levels. And if I haven't persuaded you to pick up a copy um, this evening, um, I'll just let the author do the speaking for me. Um, so I'd really like to introduce Natalie Warren, my friend Natalie, uh, who is always filled with energy, with curiosity, with an enormous heart and spirit. Uh, she's, at, uh, she's always ready at a note, uh, you know, at a, just at a notice to pick up her sax or her guitar and to always lend a hand. Um, she's got the broadest shoulders of anyone and she can paddle in the bow, uh, for hour upon hour and never lift her head. Um, she's a marvel. And so I'd like to introduce tonight, Natalie Warren. Thank you so much, Anne, for your enthusiasm and support and encouragement over the years. Your endeavors have inspired many women, including myself, to go on adventures and I'm just, I'm so thrilled to share the stage with you and to share this virtual stage with everyone here tonight. So thank you so much for attending this virtual book launch to celebrate finally the release of my book, Hudson Bay Bound. I'd like to thank my good friend Lee for moderating. We've been on many canoe expeditions together through the years and she has collaborated on the map for the book and photographs for the book. And I just want to thank her so much for being here tonight. It means a lot to me. A huge thank you to uh, the University of Minnesota Press for publishing this story, for taking a chance on a new author, especially Christian Tweeden for editing the book with me, always keeping my voice and always keeping the reader in the canoe. I also want to thank Steve Kinsella for his mentorship through this process and my dad, Richard Warren, for editing my first drafts. The person I need to thank the most here is my paddling partner, Ann Rejo, for trusting me with our story. It's a very difficult thing to do to have your friend write a book about something you shared. So thank you, Ann Rejo. All right. Oh, I'm already cheering up. It's going to be fine. <laughs> I'd like to take this moment to pledge $100 to each partnering organization tonight 
for the amazing work that they do to protect places and invaluable natural systems. So Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness uh, for hosting the event on their Zoom and Maya right now, special shout out. She is the Zoom webinar puppet master. She is controlling everything on the back end. So thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm crying. It's been a long time coming. And uh, Friends of the Mississippi River, thank you for being a part of this event. St. Croix River Association, who I used to work for, and Voyagers Conservancy. All of these groups do amazing work to protect these natural spaces and their resources are often very limited. So please join me in donating to those organizations today. <laughs> I'm gonna kick things off tonight by reading the prologue of Hudson Bay Bound. This is a coming of age story of adventure and friendship and interconnected relationships with land and water. Sometimes a great adventure lands in your lap. That's exactly what happened on a chilly February day in my dorm room at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. Anne flung the door of my dorm room open with fire in her eyes and a book in her hand. I had been cooped up all day writing a paper. The interruption, although abrupt, was a welcome break to a gloomy and uneventful day. She lingered in the doorway with a familiar smirk on her face. Yes, Anne, how can I help you this fine evening? I asked facetiously. We'd been scheming trips together for four years, and it seemed every adventure started with Anne standing in the doorway with that same expression. She threw the book at me from across the room. Read this, she said. We should do it. I looked down at the book, canoeing with the Cree, now lying on the bed in front of me. There was a silhouette of two people paddling a canoe on the cover. I looked back up to respond, but Anne was gone. The monotony of the day was getting to me. I needed a break. Reading a chapter or two would provide a welcome respite from schoolwork. But after the first few chapters, I just kept going, flying through the story of two men, Eric Severide and Walter Seaport, who in 1930 paddled from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay. They were fresh out of high school and didn't have sleeping bags or maps for the long journey. Their story was documented by the Minneapolis Star and their adventurous spirit brought them to the shores of Hudson Bay, inspiring supporters and skeptics across the country. Severide and Port traveled through agricultural rivers and wild waters of the North. I began wondering what those rivers looked like today. If we decided to make the trip, would we too get lost on Mud Lake near the headwaters of the Minnesota River and be hopelessly windbound on Lake Winnipeg? Hours passed as I continued reading, furiously flipping pages about the native community at Norway House and how Eric and Walter went to church at York Factory on the shores of Hudson Bay. Meanwhile, the gray sky outside my window had turned to black. The cafeteria was long closed by now, so I shoved a granola bar into my mouth and finished the last few pages of the book by Headlamp. I closed the book and shut my eyes. Yes, I want to do this trip, I thought. Why not? Everyone around me was frantically apply applying for jobs and very few people were hearing back from prospective employers. What else was I going to do after graduation? I wanted something more than the seemingly predictable life path in front of me. I felt an itch to do something crazy. An energy inside me was overflowing, yearning to get out and get going. And no internship or entry level job could fulfill my desire to live and breathe and feel the earth around me. The next day I threw the book back at Anne and said, I'm in. What I didn't know was just what I was signing up for or how it would profoundly change my perceptions of everything around me. My city upbringing and higher education did not prepare me to unbiasedly interact with people who were different from myself. Yet on this expedition, I would be forced into uncomfortable situations with people from a variety of backgrounds, especially political, and would slowly begin to witness the complex web of humanity. Preparing for our expedition to Hudson Bay taught us several life skills. In many ways, it was like starting our own business. I learned more about communication, public relations, fundraising, event planning, and marketing than I ever had at school. I initially saw this trip as a hole in my resume, in reality, it was the key component to unfolding my career. 
There is a big difference between going on an expedition and just going camping. On an expedition, you feel a sense of urgency to continue on a trail and will only relax long enough to rejuvenate. When camping, you're there to relax and enjoy the surroundings. You don't feel the need to push yourself beyond your comfort zone just to cover more ground. I'm not sure what made us so focused and driven to reach Hudson Bay. I often thought about the psychology behind what makes anyone hell-bent on one thing, while knowing that in the big scheme of things, their greatest passions seem minuscule and unimportant. Before and during the trip, Anne and I knew that nothing would stop us from making it to the bay. Sometimes we would turn it into a game. What if a bear bites my leg off, Anne would ask. We'd temporarily evacuate, go to a hospital for bandages, and then I would portage you for the rest of the trip. What if our boat capsizes and sinks to the bottom of Lake Winnipeg, I'd ask. We'd swim to shore, find help, and use all our money to get another boat. This game of what if gave us the confidence and determination to continue on through the most challenging parts of our journey. For 85 days, we faced fierce weather, wild animals, and changing communities. The biggest unforeseen challenge, however, was to our own relationship. How could two best friends reach a point where they had to resort to communicating through handwritten letters, even though day in and day out, they were always within feet of each other? This is the story of how Anne Rejo and I became the first two women to recreate Eric Severide and Walter Port's route to Hudson Bay, a route that has been attempted and sometimes completed many times since it was popularized in 1930. It is also an account of the present day condition of the lakes and rivers between the Twin Cities and Hudson Bay. The people who live on these waters and the communities that shape them. It explores the intrinsic connection that human beings have to moving water and reflects on the raw challenges we faced as two women making history. So I am going to, hello, I am so excited to be here and I am going to share a little bit about our route before we do some other things. Most of the second half of the evening is really gonna be Q&A. So as Lee said in the beginning, as you have questions, you can post them to the Q&A, the chat. Here is the beautiful map that Lee Vu created. So this expedition story is more than a fun adventure that we took a decade ago. Paddling this route, Anne and I flowed through indigenous and settler colonial history, scars and current struggles, invisible political boundaries, multiple ontologies of the people on the waterways and the physical connectivity of the land, water and air. Interconnected and storied relationships of people in place were central to our expedition as we moved slowly, very slowly sometimes and methodically for 2000 miles. The canoe itself and the act of canoeing allowed us to truly witness and digest scenes on the water. I think it's important to ground these reflections in place and space by providing an overview of our route. And what better way to do that than with Lee's beautiful map. So the Minnesota River, you can see we had to actually paddle southwest before we could start moving north. It does a little check mark at Mankato. Here is a video of us launching. We left during the 2011 flood on June 2nd and where we were supposed to depart from was underwater. And so we found just a random outlet at Fort Snelling State Park to launch onto the river. We had to paddle upstream for the first 330 miles of our expedition. Now, Maya is going to launch a poll that asks you how many miles per hour do you think that we could paddle upstream during a flood? All right, oh, the three, three to four is ambitious. So we could paddle one to two, so about 1.5 miles per hour. And we would average about 10 to 15 hours of paddling a day. All right, sorry, I'm gonna hop back in here.
There we go. Okay. And then, so, sorry, the Minnesota River. It's a beautiful underrated recreational river. However, it's also a polluted agricultural river. On this section of our expedition, we saw firsthand how the way we grow food poisons the water and strips the land. Stopping to rest by cornfields, we felt the deep irony of being both on a farm and in a food desert. We saw the hardened soil cracked open on barren fields and the eroded banks cut by high waters, the flooding worsened by tiling practices and the farmers left wanting. Time spent in a canoe allowed us the space really to think and talk about different ways of living, ones that are working with the earth instead of against it. Our muscles pulsed with every upstream stroke as our minds tried to make sense of the thick tension and contradiction that was all around us on this section of our trip. At the headwaters of the Minnesota River near Ortonville, Minnesota, we connected with the Boys de Sioux River, which meets up with the Ottertail River to mark the beginning of the Red River of the North. Living the dream downstream, we would say, as we paddled 50 to 60 miles a day in the hot July sun. The river was still flooded. Sometimes we paddled directly over cornfields to cut corners. This town used to be cool, locals would tell us as we passed boarded up buildings on main streets. Sometimes we felt more alone on the Red River than we did in the remote wilderness. Perhaps it was the dilapidated buildings by the water signifying the absence of something that was there before. We met old men getting older, alone on their farms with no one to take over their fields. The chemicals in the soil did more than trickle into the water. But there was a vibrancy in the people we met too, a sense of community and place that would bring any urbanite to their knees, an ancient energy that lives on in those who care for the inter interconnected web of all things. Onward to Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg is the 11th largest lake in the world in terms of surface area with beach party vibes on the South shore and rugged wilderness to the North. We paddled 280 miles up the East shore in 18 days, but we probably doubled our mileage zigzagging the waves just to stay afloat. This part of our journey held a bear encounter, several windbound days and a fight. During a night paddle, the Milky Way reflected on the surface of the still lake. It felt like we were paddling through space. Angry voices echoed across the vast expanse of water as Anne and I aired out frustrations with each other. The northern lights danced in the sky above, and it was my first time seeing them. I wanted to tell Anne how lucky I was to be there with her, but we weren't talking. On Lake Winnipeg, we were again reminded of the connectivity of all water as we paddled through a sea of toxic algal blooms, a smelly green slime carpet floating just below the surface caused by agricultural runoff. The Red River's resurgence. Weather reminded us that we were not in control and tears flowed when we saw the opening to the Nelson River at Warren's Landing. So before reaching the Hayes River, we were taken in like family by the Mishwagans at Norway House First Nation. And we were confronted with the sobering reality that when people are forcefully taken from their land, they are also stripped of their future. We adopted a third fluffy member to our expedition team for reasons beyond just the allure of live polar bear bait. We named her Maihan, and I'm still impressed we didn't swamp our canoe as she rode the rapids on top of our bear barrel. Playfulness returned in our relationship as we expertly maneuvered the tricky rapids on the Hayes River. We drank water directly from the, the river without filtering. And I sometimes worry that my daughter will never be able to experience that simple pleasure. The water there still breathes, it sinks, it expands into the landscape. It's a reminder of what rivers could be, of what we have already lost, and of what requires constant and fierce protection. I felt an emptiness when we arrived at York Factory on Hudson Bay. It felt like arriving at a funeral, celebrating the end of a life in a canoe with my best friend. But at least Anne and I were there together. So I have a video and a song that I would like to share with you. Mm -hmm. 
It's a song that we would sing fairly often on our trip. Well, I've been walking in my sleep. I've been counting troubles instead of counting sheep. And where the years went, I just can't say. Just turn around and they've gone on the way. Well, I've been sifting through the layers of dusty books and faded papers. They tell a story that I used to know, one that happened so long ago, and it's gone away in yesterday. Now I find myself on the mountainside where the rivers change direction across the great divide. Now I heard the owl calling so softly as the night was falling she asked a question and i replied but she's gone now across the border line and it's gone away in yesterday. Now I find myself on the mountainside where the rivers change direction across the great divide. We arrived at Anne's family cabin at the end of the Gunflint Trail in northern Minnesota. 
We should have been exhausted. We should have rolled into bed and slept for days, but we stayed up for hours, drinking champagne and sharing stories with friends and family, singing and laughing late into the night. The next morning, I woke up to find Anne sitting on the porch, sipping coffee and looking out at the lake, Maihan by her side. For the first time in nearly three months, there was no map to tell us where to go next, no goal we needed to reach that day. I poured myself a cup of coffee and sat down in the large wooden chair next to her. I glanced at her and attempted a smile, but no expression or words could say anything that she did not already know. We had acted as one person for three months. Every decision we made was made as a team. My memories and feelings were hers too. We had learned to compromise, challenge each other, surprise each other, and take care of each other. In the process, even through our trials and frustrations, we had learned to love one another more deeply than any friendship. The lakes here seem smaller now, don't they? She said quietly, keeping her gaze on the opposite shore. I nodded. We clinked our coffee mugs together and sat there for several hours without speaking, staring at the water, our once and forever home. So now we are going to move into Q and A. <laughs> um, Lee, I believe you're moderating this Q and A. Yes, I am. That was beautiful, Natalie. I love hearing you sing, and it's oh, always thanks. a pleasure when I my ears are bestowed upon that. Um, and it always brings <laughs> back all our memories from all the trips we've been on. Um, I hope people have enjoyed the evening so far. Um, I see one of the questions, but people are probably wondering, where is that dog now? Where's well, my hot? Question. Oh, oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> And here, Cohen, my hun. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How's this it feels going? like a regular FaceTime chat that we I know. have. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, Anne. So this is Anne and, and my hun in the back. Um, look at her. <laughs> and I think off. Um, you know what was the environmental lessons? That the both of you learned on this journey? Um, Natalie, do you want to start or do you want me? Do you want to uh, take a break? <laughs> yeah, you, you go for it. I'll, uh, you know, spot my face a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, after this trip, went to get my PhD and master's in ecology because I felt that my, um, the way that I could contribute to the world would be to help understand it better using mathematics. Um, and so now I work on understanding um, how ecosystems move over long time scales, like the hundreds to thousands of years. And that was all inspired by our trip where we passed through several different types of ecosystems. Um, starting from the prairie and moving into the temperate forest and the boreal forest. Yeah, and so Anne and I were such a great partnership for this trip because I think our journals are really different in that I talked a lot about the stories and the people that we met and Anne's journal was like, these are the birds that we saw today and these types of trees and you know, obviously other things as well. But uh, our backgrounds and our specialties, the things that we love to do, I think complement each other very, very well in terms of thinking environmentally about this trip. For me, paddling with water, like I was saying before, is a really powerful thing because you cannot ignore the interconnectedness of the world around us, including us and our role in it. And so to be able to pass over those cornfields and to know the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the chemicals that are going onto the land are going directly into the water, causing the algal blooms that we actually paddled over. And so we're moving slowly and observing all of these things. And for me, I had studied environmental issues in school and reading and talking about it is so important, but something hit home for me when we were actually out in the world, experiencing it, seeing it, 
talking to people about living on the land and the water where they live. Um, I just want to point out that someone was like, one of you has a Minogen water bottle. We all went to Minogen, so shout out to Camp Minogen um, <laughs> for uniting us. Um, the other question that I think people are wondering is, um, you know, after completing this trip, what did you wish you knew before you left that would have changed how you approached the planning? Hmm, Anne? I think um, at the time, you know, we were like fresh out of college and feeling really confident. Um, and so I think that a lot of people told us not to paddle across Lake Winnipeg. And I appreciate their concern then um, and now, but I don't think that we were really very good at listening to those kind of concerns back then. Um, and so I guess I'm both happy and, um, you know, just like that, that we didn't, or that we, we, we got some advice and we didn't really take it back then, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's not like we weren't gonna paddle like Winnipeg though, right? Well, in the canoeing with the Cree, you know, they do um, get a ride, they hitch a ride and we get hitched a ride too for a little bit. Um, and so I think that that was just some of the advice that we should, you know, kind of skip over that or get a ride on some kind mm -hmm. of a motorized boat. Um, and so I'm glad we didn't do that, but I guess I wish I would have known a little bit more about how to paddle in shallow lakes because Lake Winnipeg is very shallow. Um, and so the waves are a little bit different than a lot of the lakes that we'd paddle on before that are a lot deeper. They're like more choppy. Yeah, absolutely. So when the wind blows, the waves would pick up quickly. And I think we figured out pretty early on when we were doing our night paddle from Beaconia, those rock gardens that would be in particular spaces near the shore. So you couldn't paddle too close to shore or else you would beach on these rocks, but you couldn't be too far out because the waves would pick up and then you'd be in trouble. And so I think, you know, we we took the advice that was helpful to us at the time. And I think we figured that the route sort of teaches you things as, as you go along and you can pick up on that. The book doesn't talk a lot about gear or planning for those people who are really into it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a boat and it floated and it was out. No, we had a, we had a Kevlar boat, which for <laughs> this type of trip, you really want to use a different type of canoe for upstream paddling, downstream paddling, large lake paddling and whitewater paddling. But the best boat is a free boat. So we, we planned for that. You know, Natalie, in this book, um, it's basically a reflection of your friendship with Anne. Um, what was it like paddling together for 85 days, uh, which could make or break any relationship, in my opinion? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, Natalie does a really good job of describing kind of the trend in um, our relationship in the canoe. Um, we, at times it was the best thing ever, you know, to be within six feet of your friend, which now, you know, COVID, you couldn't do that, I guess, but um, you, at all times, it was the, it was awesome, and Natalie, you know, is always singing, always has jokes, and so it was like constant entertainment, and just really, we're really having like the summer of our lives, um, but then, you know, at other times, I really wanted to escape or needed somebody to talk to besides Natalie. And that can be really hard when, you know, there's really no one else in your canoe. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenging thing to do to be with someone for so long. And I talk about in the book as us essentially being one person because it's not like I could do one thing and you could do another thing. We had to be in the boat together doing the same thing. And so it wasn't even that we would compromise. It was that we had to come to the same exact decision, which was challenging at different points. Cause you know, I was not as concerned about our safety a lot of the time. And I often say, you're the reason that we survived because you had to be that person in a lot of situations to, to bring up our safety and doing the, the best thing for that. Uh, although looking back on it, I can look at my friendships in life now, day to day. And I'm so glad that we were able to do this trip and fight. 
because I think fighting is a really important component of friendships, which is something that I didn't grow up just knowing. I thought, you, you know, like you fight with your lover, your partner, but why would you ever fight with your friends? And I think it, it's helpful in any relationship to air out those frustrations and talk about them and have conflict and confront that conflict. And then to come out on the other side, I think even stronger. Yeah, for sure. And I know you say like you wouldn't have survived without maybe me making like safety decisions, but I think that I wouldn't have survived without you making it more fun. You know, I think I was taking it a little bit too seriously at the time because I was nervous about like, you know, getting hurt. Um, yeah. So I'll have to write the next book. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> it describes my perspective on that. <laughs> my hung got pretty excited when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you kind of give us a sense of how the water changed from beginning until you got to Hudson Bay? Um, yeah, it started off pretty like the water, like the color um, or like the, what do you think? Just like well, so the Minnesota River, they call the river of chocolate milk. And it is, I'm an advocate for paddling the Minnesota River. I think it's a beautiful river, but it has some serious issues. And I think it is a very polluted river. And it has um, a, a lot of the sediment that flows from the Minnesota River, flows into the Mississippi, and then settles into Lake Pepin, where the lake's slowly filling in, right? So there, there are all these things going on. And we were there during a flood. So the water was really murky. And then we only got you know, more and more pristine. Do you remember when we turned on to the Etchamamish? Right, that we saw the color change. Yeah. The color change, and I thought it was an oil spill because it was so, it was just black. But then when we went over it, you could actually see all the way, your paddle all the way to the bottom. And and then to be able to drink water out of the Hayes River, I think was was really special. Yeah, and it was interesting for us because we are used to from being at Minot in pretty pristine places. So personally, it was hard for me like to feel like we were on a wilderness trip at first because we were kind of still in this urban environment that was affected by all the urban environment stuff. Yeah, people kept bringing us cupcakes <laughs> and yes. inviting us over for dinner, box. you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the cupcake box. <laughs> Which we, we appreciated. Yeah, we did. But I think you can look in, you know, historical accounts of the Minnesota River, and they say that it was like a great place to catch fish and you could see to the bottom. Um, so I don't know. That's all interesting. Yeah, I think I was gonna say it kind of flows to the next question of like, yeah, how did you handle resupplying for food and supplies? Um, we had my parents meet us in a few places. Um, to give us, thanks mom and dad. Uh, to yep, thank you. <laughs> um, Shout out. <laughs> yeah, to give us some more food. And we also had um, someone mail us food to Norway house where we got my Han, but some, a lot of the food ended up getting eating, eaten by another stray dog. So that's why we had to kind of survive on pancakes at the end. Yeah, any form of Bisquick was what was for dinner. <laughs> Luckily, amazing what someone, ratios can do yeah luckily someone gave us a bottle of like maple syrup so <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that yeah and for food just, yeah so grocery stores and then we packed things out and then we didn't have any of the you know pre-freeze-dried type stuff we would make all of our own meals on a camp stove mm -hmm. Yeah, Natalie was making some really good dehydrated egg omelets um, at some point on Lake Winnipeg in there. We had the bacon bits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the ginger chocolate at one point. I found it interesting how we fell into roles because I feel like I did a lot of the cooking and you did a lot of the setting up camp. And I don't know that we ever talked about that. It was just sort of, you know, the things that we wanted to do to divide labor. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was kind of, um, I'd heard from, I think Maureen Martin, if you're out there, that um, a good time to like get your alone time fix was to like collect firewood. And so I think I was like taking that pretty seriously. My tent tape putting up time was my alone time. <laughs> Still right next to each other getting some alone time. Yeah. 
Um, were there any memorable animal encounters at all? Yeah, so we had a bear encounter on Lake Winnipeg. It was a weird day in general, I would say, because we were trying to do a night paddle, but the moon didn't come out. And then we felt like something was weird in the air. And so we pulled over and then this huge lightning storm came through, orange sky. Someone asked what kind of bear, it was just a black bear And at, at this point. And we, you know, throughout the night, we weren't falling asleep. We were worried about the storm, the waves were picking up. And then finally, I feel like we get to sleep and then I hear something and I wake up and I see these bear paws pushing down on the tent. And so I jump to the other side of the tent. And I remember I got a bruise on my leg because I landed on the travel guitar. And Anne's mom, Pam, hi, Pam. She wanted us to bring a small foghorn with us to scare bears away. And so we brought it and finally we get to use it. And so we're rummaging around our pack looking for this tiny foghorn. And then we go to take it out and push it and it goes wah, 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 wah. So it had gotten wet or something, so it didn't work, but we just got out of the tent and you look really big, make loud sounds. And the bear ran into the woods, which as the weather got worse, we ended up taking our poles down and because our tent was starting to lift on the corners. And then we basically followed the bear in the middle of the night into the woods to sit on our life jackets in lightning position. And here you are, you survived. So that's really important to note. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you, Pam. I thank you, Pam. Mom. She always is prepared. Um, yeah, I, I guess one thing I'll say about that that I was talking to my partner, Rachel, about is like, I guess when you're outside for a long period of time, you start to like notice less the weather, unless it's like keeping you from canoeing. Um, so sometimes when I look at those pictures, like I know I took a picture because it was a crazy storm, but I don't know if you feel the same way, Natalie, that at some point you kind of like don't care as much that it's raining and stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Unless, as long as you can keep moving, then it's fine. Well, we got stuck in that hail storm on the Red River and that made us stop. And then the winds on Lake Winnipeg, when they got really bad, we had to stop. But other than that, it's just, you know, you keep going until nature doesn't let you keep going anymore. Yeah. Um, someone asked, is there any particular order that you would recommend for them to read the book? Meaning Hudson Bay Bound, Canoe with the Cree, one before the other? I think it'd be cool to do Canoeing with the Cree first. But I don't know. I haven't. I haven't read them back to back. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Well. Yeah. The one. One of the uh, scenes in *Canoeing with the Cree* that stands out to me is that they see like their first white-tailed deer at some point. Um. So I don't know. Maybe it could be cool to read *Hudson Bay Bound* first and then realize like the change back in time. Yeah. Some things were very different, but there were some moments like places that we got lost were very similar. I think Play Green Lake, everyone sort of gets lost there. And then I think Mud Lake, but they were in Canoeing with the Cree, they were able to paddle the Boys de Sioux before it was channelized by the Army Corps, which would be a very, very different experience than what we had. So yeah, yeah. you'll have to let any, me know. Is there any one or two interesting characters that you met along the way? That you would like to talk about? <laughs> what do you remember, Anne? Yeah, um, I guess the first thing that came to my mind because my hunts here is we met the caretaker at York Factory who had a German Shepherd that was like as big as the polar bear that we saw at York Factory too. And he, um, I don't know, I think this polar bear just like went wherever with him. And so the German Shepherd like swam out two miles into Hudson Bay to chase some seals in the water. And then, you know, came back and like bought off a polar bear from like eating in the garbage at the, <laughs> at the station. So I don't know, that guy must, yeah, I don't know. And the, I guess that's the character's more his dog, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that dog was crazy. Yeah. 
I um, I always think of the germ. Well, so Lake Winnipeg had a lot of characters on it for me, and I think the community, the Princess Harbor community, the older people that we stayed with and played cribbage with and played music for for one of our windbound days really stands out. And I still have the wooden bird carving from Princess Harbor that they gave us. One of the many things we had to portage for the rest of our trip. Yeah, they had, built, they had built all these small replicates of all the steamships that had been on Lake Winnipeg. And so that was really cool to see like, just like, you know, a hundred little wooden steamships around their house that were all like painted the right color and stuff. And I remember there at Princess Harbor too, they had tons of lilies growing um, yeah. when we were there. Um, yeah, so that was awesome. I felt at that point, I think I wanted to stay there like maybe forever. <laughs> <laughs> like didn't want to keep going after that. But. Yeah, if we had stopped at all, it would have been at Princess Harbor. <laughs> but then we would have never got my hon. Yeah. Yeah, my Han is the reason why my dog loves the book and every <laughs> dog that we had showed at the beginning of the event. Um, this question asks, so are there, are you glad that you didn't know certain things before you left? Um, because it could have affected maybe your decisions to think that it was crazy to do what you were going to do? Mm, I guess, no. Yeah, I think I we were know. pretty, we were pretty like hell bent on it. Like Natalie says, like we talk, we would talk a lot about like if we lost limbs, how we would keep going. <laughs> um, and so I feel like somebody could have said, you know, the earth breaks apart right here and you have to like crawl into some lava <laughs> and we would have been like, okay, <laughs> okay, what kind of ladder do we need, you know? Um. <laughs> yeah, and I think some what this question makes me think of too is like, I don't, I'm glad I didn't know what it felt like to paddle slowly upstream before we paddled slowly upstream because we just had to get there and do it. It's not, it's a very challenging experience. It's a mental game more than anything. And I don't know that I would have been able to do it twice if I already had conceptualized what it would be like. You just kind of got to throw yourself in. Yeah, I remember it was really hot too, like so 110 hot. or something, really, really hot. Yeah, um, I had all those blisters on my skin that I would pop. Yeah. And then it, we had the constant dilemma of like, it's we're putting on sunscreen, but it's not doing anything. But if we put on a layer, you're dying because you're so hot. And so there was just no winning at a certain point. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Our dear Oh, our dear friend Emily Torgimson asks, how did you and Anne build the confidence and skills to take on this challenge? Um, how did you think about encouraging or supporting the next person, like people to be the next first and take on their own challenge in the wilderness? <laughs> Great question, Em. Slightly leading. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so Anne and I met at YMCA Camp Minogen. And I saw someone else had this question too, in terms of how we became best friends to even go on this journey together. And we were assigned paddling partners on our long trip through Minogen called FOMS in Nunavut, Canada, paddling the Kazan Kunwak Inuit Heritage Rivers. And so we got to spend a summer together in a canoe. And then we ended up in the same college freshman dorm. Sort of history after that. We didn't, we weren't very good at making friends for a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, when we got there, I wanted to play ultimate frisbee, which I did right away. And Natalie wanted to play ultimate frisbee, but I told her no, because that was my thing. <laughs> and then when I played ultimate frisbee two years later, she was like, well, I don't know why you didn't play earlier. <laughs> uh, but so to get back to the second part of M's question in terms of how do we want to essentially pay it forward, I think a big part of telling this story, so I, I didn't know that I was going to write a book. It was sort of random in a way that I, I knew I wanted to document what we did. And I went, I was giving a presentation one day and this guy came in and he was wearing a St. Olaf hat, a St. Olaf sweater and St. Olaf sweatpants. 
And he said, I went to St. Olaf too. And I was like, okay. And he had graduated 50 years before us and started, we started being pen pals and he wanted to know more about our trip. And so I started documenting things. And then those were kind of what I stitched together to start the book. But my hope for sharing this story is to get more people to do things like this and to show that there is another way to go about living life. There's a, there's a different narrative at play. You know, you can do crazy things if you're, you know, prepared and of course all of those things, but it doesn't have to be sort of a, a predictable life path of, you know, college, job, marriage, kids, all of these things. You can do a bunch of different things and you're going to be paddling upstream when you do do them because it's it still is a really unique thing when people step outside of the cultural norm, I think. And so I'm hoping that through sharing this story, people can read it and start to scheme their own adventures and realize that it's totally normal and it should be totally normal for people to actually spend time in the wilderness or with the land and, and with the water in a way that allows them to sort of take a break from the life that you're going to be living for a really, really long time. Yeah, totally. I think that, you know, we like, I can feel a little bit shy about this trip because it's like, I don't know, something like I oh, did a long time ago or something, but you know, I'm really proud of Natalie for writing this book because it gives like a window into an experience that, you know, took a lot of um, like ingenuity and courage and a lot of support from our um, community to complete, but was still a risk and, you know, to try to encourage other people to take risks to, you know, reach their dreams. Thank you. Agreed. That. Yeah. What do you think, Lee? Yeah, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I've been on many adventures with these two, um, and each one is always feels like it's new, um, and I just kind of get dragged along with it. Um, but you know, sometimes you have to be the, be the first to even redefine what the first means. Um, because why is there the first, right? Like it should just be normalized. Like everyone and anyone can do this. Yeah. But I think that concludes our Q and A and Natalie has a special. Um, yeah, so in that vein, like to... I will end with a poem, a poem that has inspired me when I'm thinking about different things to do in my life, different situations where I'm presented with opportunities, I often go back and read this poem. It's by Robert Bly. It's called The Man Who Wanted to Live His Life Over, but it's called The Woman Who Wanted to Live Her Life Over for me. What, you want to live your life over again? Well, I suppose, yes. That time in Grand Rapids, my life as I lived it was a series of shynesses. Being bolder, what good would that do? I'd open my door again. I felt abashed, you see. Now I'd go out and say, all right, I'll go with you to Alaska. Just opening the door from inside would have altered me a little. I'm too shy. And so a bolder life is what you want? We could begin now. Just walk with me down to the river. I'll pretend this boat is my life. I'll climb in. I want to thank you all so much for attending this virtual book launch. I wish I could meet you in person and that we could sign books, but please get a signed book from Majors and Quinn. And I hope that we can chat more in the future. Thank you so much for reading my book. It means the world to me. You don't even know. So thank you. <laughs>